One. What's that? Oh, after the two Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if, if this would be a fully accurate statement, but to me, Isaiah is one of the most encouraging books of prophecy because it offers so much hope. Last week we looked at a little bit of condemnation for a believer, but I think one of the most marvelous things about this, about this prophecy that the Lord gave Isaiah is how much hope is in it. And it's just, it's, it's interspersed, it's mixed. And I'll tell you something, sometimes uh, prophecy doesn't have hope and it, and, it, and it can't have hope because of a heart's attitude and heart's condition. Now we're going to read our text this morning. We're in Isaiah chapter 1. And uh, we'll read our text and right after that. Uh, we'll pray and we'll ask the Lord to help us. Uh, before we do that, let me just say uh, a little bit about uh, Brother Nick had mentioned about our sacrificial offering. I was thinking this, this last week about something that had to do with it. I've been uh, playing the Monopoly game, and I think it's over with tomorrow. The McDonald's Monopoly, it's over on the 24th. And matter of fact, McDonald's um, denied me Monopoly pieces this week because they said, well, we're not getting any more because over on the 24th. Well, I should get the ones until the 24th. But anyway, I, I'm not angry about it. I'm not upset. I'm not bitter. I just want boardwalk, and that's all there is to it. If you win, uh, if you get uh, something at McDonald's and... Um, I have been eating at McDonald's this last week. That was the place I ate more than anything else. You say, Pastor, you shouldn't do that. Well, I don't have a kitchen right now. And uh, <laughs> I don't have a living room or anything else. And so um, <laughs> I, mean, I own one, but it's, it's destroyed. Uh, I destroyed it. Anyway, so I ate at McDonald's quite a bit last week. And I was talking to Melissa about this. And I asked her, I said, if you had, if you got boardwalk, what would you do? I said, would you give? Well, what percent would you give? And um, I said, would you give 50 is what I said. And she's like, 50, $50? I said, $50? No, I said, 50%. In other words, 50% uh, of what you won. You know, when we think about that, um, I always think about, well, our church needs a million dollars to be able to make an offer on a building. And that's, that's quite a bit to me. Um, maybe to some of you, it probably isn't quite as much to you as it is to me, but it's quite a bit. And <laughs> why is everybody making faces at me? It's probably less to me than it is to you. Uh, it, it seems like a great deal, but if I um, got boardwalk at McDonald's, that would be a million dollars. They probably would figure out a way to make sure it didn't equal that amount. I have a friend that won a million dollars on an M by getting a gray M and M in the M and M packages years ago, and they paid them out in um, I guess payments over time instead of giving you a lump payment and then taxes takes puts a big hit in it. But I was thinking, man, if you gave it all to the church, then probably they couldn't nail you for taxes as much if you if you just donated the whole thing. And so my thought is, well, I just give the whole million dollars uh, to the church if, if I won a million dollars on Monopoly. You know what? I don't live for winning the Monopoly, Monopoly game at McDonald's. I'm making light of that and being a little bit silly about it. But the fact of the matter is that a principle of biblical stewardship is that God entrusts to us as much as we're faithful with. Amen. And many of us lack because we are not faithful stewards. And God understands and He knows that. He knows our hearts better than we are know our own. And I wonder, uh, I just thought last week, I thought, you know what, if we were really honest about what we would do, I bet you we'd decide what we're going to do when we got the million dollars. Or as we'd say what we're going to do before we did, but when we had a million dollars and it was ours to do with as we please, I bet we'd decide how much of it uh, we should give to the Lord and how much we wouldn't. And I just want to tell you something with regard to the church building fund. If you would decide how much you'd give to the Lord, God would give it to you to give. And I just believe that. I think it's just a fact. You say, God, I'll give this much. And you'll commit it to the Lord. And I mean commit it in a way that you're not going to go back on. God, this is my plan. This is what I intend to do. And nothing's going to come up where I'm going to need something or where it would be smart for me to do something else. But God, I'll commit this to you. I promise you, God could trust us with that kind of an attitude. I'll tell you, if he gave us a million dollars, I don't, I, don't know if he, I don't know if we're trustworthy enough to bring it. If he got to deliver this to the church offering plate, I don't know if it would make it. And, uh, you know, 
the fact of the matter is that that really is the way it is with regard to what God gives us. He's called us to be faithful stewards with everything that He gives us. It belongs to Him. And if we're not faithful and we don't do exactly what He wants with it, we've stolen from God in a sense. We've, we've taken, we, we have been unfaithful stewards. And so I just want to ask you to take a week and ask the Lord to search your heart about that matter. Say, God, what could you trust me with? Just ask Him. Ask Him about it. And then be honest about what He reveals to you, to you about it. And honestly, I think it'll make a big difference in our lives. It really will. So just consider that. It's just a thought that I had. Maybe it's no good. Maybe it's only a good thought for me. But it helped me uh, with my thinking, and I think that it'll help all of us. You want to know what the answer is? If I want a million dollars, what would I do with it? I'll tell you next week. All right. Uh, if I remember, if you remember to ask me. Chapter 1, verse 5, Isaiah. Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devoured in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage and a vineyard, as a lodge in the garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Now look down with me, if you will, to verse 16. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widows. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. And Heavenly Father, help us this morning to see this call for repentance. And Lord, help us as believers, as your children, as individuals that are not only uh, that, that, are, that are not only saved, but Father, but that seek your will in our lives. Help us to have victory. And God, I pray that you would show us some truth about you and help us to learn to live for you regardless of the times we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week we looked at uh, just an introduction into this letter of prophecy. We really looked at the, at the prophet. We looked at Isaiah and we saw that Isaiah was a prophet in times, for the most part in his life, that really were pretty good. He was a prophet under three kings who were known to be godly men. He was a prophet under one king who was known not to be. And we'll look at some of the application for that. But it's interesting then, if you will, to understand that this prophecy opens up during the time, during the reign of King Uzziah. We saw last week that Isaiah was probably Uzziah's nephew. His brother would have been Uzziah's, uh, I'm sorry, his father would have been Uzziah's brother. And so Isaiah is not uh, like Amos, if you will. He's not like some of the, uh, I think, don't misunderstand, not, not like some of the redneck prophets, uh, <laughs> if you will. I, I'm serious. They, some, of the, some of the prophets were like, were farmers, and I mean, they were rough, rough guys. And uh, hey, don't hate rednecks. Uh, John the Baptist would have been a redneck prophet, I think, in my opinion. It, understanding it in a good sense of the word and not in a bad sense. But uh, Isaiah wasn't like that. He was royalty. And he would have had, had access to the court in a way that was not like any of the other prophets. And so you see a lot of the language in this prophecy is a very lofty, a very, um, if you will, a high... Um, I guess a high quality grammar the Holy Spirit used through Isaiah as a result of the man that he used. And if you read, uh, for instance, like the book of Amos and, and so forth, you'll find that it wasn't exactly the same as far as the, the grammar. And we don't want to get into that this morning. I just want to point out last week we saw that Isaiah was a prophet during good times and during bad times. And last week, the application that we saw is that you can serve the Lord. And it really doesn't matter what's going on in your surroundings. It doesn't matter about the spirit or the attitude of your country. 
It doesn't even matter well, what it is in the place in the church that God's called you to serve. Listen, some folks have been called in, into a unique ministry in their churches. I think sometimes in some areas, uh, God calls people to be a staying hand in a ministry or in a church. And they, they maybe are the only one that is really obeying the Lord in the matter of soul winning. They may be the only one that has, a, that has a right focus and a pure heart, and God's called them to that particular ministry in, in that particular place. It doesn't matter, friend, if you're the only one in your family that wants to serve the Lord. And sometimes there are individuals, man, they may be the only one that's saved in their family, the only one out of all the saved people in their family that wants to really uh, obey the Bible the way it's written, not the way Christians say you obey it, but actually say, God, I'll take your word literally, and you'll be the authority in my life, and I'll do whatever you say. And uh, so they, they may be that way. And we've seen that you can be an Isaiah regardless of the times. And Isaiah prophesied when he had good kings, and he prophesied uh, during the time of, of a bad king. In, in particular, Ahaz was, didn't follow after his, father's, uh, after his father Jotham and his grandfather Uzziah. And so he wasn't a good king, but yet Isaiah was a good prophet. I want to point all that out to you to bring you into our text this morning, because we see this morning a description of sin. We're going to see the option that every person has. We're going to see the hope this morning. We start out with that description of sin. We read it in our text last week, and I reread it in our text this week. And to me, it's, it, it, it really needs no commentary. The description that Isaiah gives of God's people, the nation of Israel. He says, why should you be stricken anymore? By the way, that's a question, and there's an answer to the question. The answer is our text this morning, verses 16 and on down. But the question is, why should you be stricken anymore? Stricken is to be, to be made sick or to be struck with something like a disease or to be cast down or put down. The question is, why should you be like this? And uh, the question also could be taken to say, how can you be stricken anymore? In other words, how could things get any worse than they are? And the description is this way. The description says, first of all, uh, the, the description of our sin is, first of all, or, uh, uh, their sin and ours by way of application, is the whole head is sick. You ever see this? This is Isaiah's motion. Your whole head's sick. What this means is the whole brain's gone. Yeah, you guys see Sidney do this sometimes when he's talking to Brother Chris. And you're like, man. <laughs> you know, and what does it mean? It means there's no soundness in it. It means it, it, the whole thing's not right. And that's literally what Isaiah says. He says the whole head is sick. And then he says uh, the whole heart faint. And so it's this. The, man, here's the problem right here. So Isaiah says, right here and right here. Well, I'll tell you something. Without the head and without the heart, what do you have? Not much. But he goes ahead and describes the rest. He says, from the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises, and in case that doesn't describe it, putrefying sores. Pastor, don't say that. Well, the Bible said it. I read it. Putrefying sores. In other words, it's just rotten. When I think of putrefying sores, I think of um, what's it, uh, what's it, what's it, the Maccabean Revolt was uh, Titus and Epiphanes. No, I'm thinking of Titus Epiphanes. Anyway, Titus went into the temple, God's temple, and he defiled it in a number of ways. And as judgment, God smote him with a sickness and with worms that literally were devouring him. If you'll read the Maccabees and read some of the Apocrypha, you'll see this account. It's an interesting historical account. And literally the man was, had such a stench of rottenness about him, he was being eaten alive by worms. Such a stench that his servants just couldn't serve him anymore. They couldn't stand to come into his presence. And he couldn't stand himself. And uh, he said, God has struck me because I defiled the temple. And he, had, he was repentant about it, actually. And he actually repented of his sin. And that's kind of the idea that this putrefying sores. In other words, you're just rotten. Literally, you are rotting alive and it decaying and it's sort of like the body gets before you get you know when you get gangrene and a limb the only thing you can do is amputate and if you amputate it on the description of these people you just have to amputate the whole thing i remember when i was a kid somebody said they had a headache and another guy said amputate and <laughs> you know well the problem with it the, the idea here is is this the whole thing's gone and there's nothing worth saving there is nothing to save here and that sounds pretty hopeless. <coughs> I want to tell you something. Without Jesus Christ, that is a good description. It's a good, accurate description of anybody that's without Jesus. 
Christian, I want to tell you, without God, that's a good, good description of the nation of Israel. It's a good description of anything without God's will and God's plan and God's way. And I'll tell you even more than that, or just as much as that, it's a good description of a Christian who's not living for God. There's nothing there that's worth anything. And so we saw last week this indictment, this, if you will, this description of our sin, and it leaves us with the understanding that there's nothing there. The, the word for the country. He describes the people and he describes the country. Your country is desolate. I've been in places where there ain't nothing but rocks. And it is the idea of desolate is famine. No rain. Nothing can grow. Nothing can survive. And we're talking about the country of the people that was described before they went into it as a land flowing with milk and honey. And God's indictment to them is their, your country is desolate, is forsaken. These are strong words, but Christian, many times we'll take something like this and we'll look at someone by way of application. I want to tell you, if you do that this morning, then you miss the whole point. Listen, your understanding somebody else's state or somebody else's position doesn't help you. You know, so many Christians think that they're so well off they can't be helped. And I promise you that was the way these individuals felt. Hey, listen, they had King Uzziah. And you know what? Uzziah walked in the ways of the Lord. He was a pretty good king. That, that kind of shocks me just a little bit. We'll see later on that the, the indictment in Isaiah is that God's going to give them pastors that are not going to lead them into sin. And the idea of pastors there is to understand it's, it's a king in the, in the nation of Israel. And God says, I'm going to appoint you pastors that won't lead, lead you into sin. But here we have pastors that are trying to honor God. They're supposed to be godly, good men. And what is said about this country who has these kings at this time is there's no soundness in it. There's nothing there. There's nothing good. And Christian, it is good for us to come to a place of realizing that about ourselves. What ourselves, I'm talking about you and I'm talking about me this morning. See, so many times we think we're so good. We think we're so good enough. We think we're just fine, and I promise you that was the way these people felt. They had a good king. They had a good prophet. The prophet had access to the court. Uh, they were probably, if you want to put them into the context of the church, they were churchgoers. And they're being told why it is that they're not effective and why it is that they're frustrated and why it is that things aren't the way that God wanted them to be. And there's no soundness. There's nothing good there. Okay, um, the whole heart is sick, and why is it? What is the reason for it? Well, look down in verse 10, if you will. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Now let me ask you a question. Contemporaneously with Isaiah, how were the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah doing? Huh? Brother Randy, tell me. Well, they weren't doing so well. They weren't doing so well. They were gone. They were destroyed. Okay, so when the scripture says, give ear to the word of the Lord, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, before it says, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. And we looked at last week how to be part of a remnant. But if the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. And then they're told, hear ye the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, they're being called Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, they're not addressed. The remnant is not being addressed here. The individuals that are not part of the remnant are being addressed. And they're being called what is, even in our day, one of the worst things you could be called. You call someone a sodomite, that is a serious accusation. It's an accusation of being purely godless, wholly given over into reprobation, and wholly given over in your flesh to every kind of sin. And these individuals are called Sodom and Gomorrah. You say, Pastor, I thought... Uzziah was one of the good kings of Israel. Yeah. Do you know that many believers think that if we just had good leadership, we'd be all right? I'll tell you something. You could have a godly king that could be part of a remnant, and you could be called Sodom. You could be a godly, you could have a, a godly uh, whatever kind of relationship with whoever. You could be in a home that has a godly parent, godly father, and you could be called Sodom. You could be in a home that has a godly mother, and your place in that home could be Sodom. 
Uh, you could, whatever it is, be in a good church that has godly people in it, and your seat has Sodom in it because of your sin, because of the way that you stand before holy God. You know, most of the time we put ourselves in the remnant automatically, and we just ignore anything that would accuse us. And God is coming right to the people that are called by His name. And He's not saying anything that has any kind of a politeness or mincing of words about it. You know, God's Word never does mince words. It says exactly what we are. It exposes us for exactly the way that we are. You know, that <laughs> it's amazing that today in our generation, we feel as though uh, people that preach the truth ought to be so polite about it. Uh, they ought to preach it in love. Um, what does that mean? What does that mean? The Bible says truth is love. Uh, I, no, that person ought to be mean. But I want to tell you something. If God gave Isaiah these words to say, you don't think very highly of God in heaven based upon the way that you receive truth. And God calls Israel, the people are called by his name, Sodom and Gomorrah. And I think that ought to get our attention. Appropriately so. He says there's no soundness in it. There's putrefying flesh. There's rottenness. I'll tell you, if you don't like it, you don't like God's word. <coughs> But it's God's indictment, God's indictment against us. And we ought to listen to it because God accuses us so that we can say guilty so that we can find out how to be guiltless. I love that about the book of Isaiah. It just it puts things right exactly how they are and then offers hope. Okay, let's look at some more description. In verse 11, another description is their religion. Now we find here these, these people are under King Uzziah, and it says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Now look at that phrase right at the beginning. There's another question. First question is, why should you be stricken anymore? Now the second question is, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? I think this is interesting. To me it makes you say, huh? What? Because isn't the problem in most generations that they're not offering sacrifice to the Lord? that are not going up to the temple of the Lord, that they're not worshiping God. And here God says, what good is what you give me? What good are your sacrifices to me? The idea of sacrifice, man, it's like, it's not small, it's big. And God says, you've sacrificed for me. And the question is, what good is it? And then he tells them what good it is. He says, I am full of burnt offerings and of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? God said, who told you to offer these sacrifices for me? And then he goes on to say, bring no more vain oblations. And then we find out what's wrong with their sacrifices. Vain. means... They don't represent the heart. Here are individuals that look to you and I as though they are obeying the law of the Lord. They're going up to the house of God and they're even making sacrifice. I want to tell you something, Christian. You and I are probably many times going to be surprised at the judgment seat. See, the judgment seat is the place where you and I stand before holy God and He evaluates everything that we've done. And he takes the things that we've done and he says whether they're gold, silver, precious stones or they're wood, hay, and stubble. And we learned in our series on grace that the thing that makes the difference between, uh, between uh, filthy rags and good works is the grace of God in our lives. And this is another place of good application for that because here are individuals that are coming and they're making sacrifice to holy God and their sacrifices are not cheap. Their sacrifices are not done at no personal expense. There is great expense. There is great sacrifice. And God says it's vain. In other words, it's not real. It's not from the heart. Uh, they're, they're giving in the way that they're required to give. And God said, I don't receive it. You ever wondered whether or not, have you ever taken the time to consider whether or not your worship is acceptable to God? You ever ask God, God, is my sacrifice to you more than just my sacrifice? Is it received by you? And Christian, if you're just flippant about it, 
Or if you're just like, well, of course God receives it. I gave it to him, and I did it the way it was supposed to be done, and he should receive it. I would submit to you this morning, it may be that at the day of judgment you'll be surprised. You say, God, haven't I? Didn't I? And God will say, no. You did what you wanted so that you didn't have to be what I wanted. You know what God wants? A broken and contrite heart that will not despise, O oh God. God wants your heart. What's the heart behind it? This is so key to anything that a Christian does. See, sometimes I'm confused because, because I can see what people do. And sometimes the thing that people does, the things that people do, look good. And it doesn't confuse me when people do the wrong thing. It confuses me when people do the right thing more than that. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? That means I, many times somebody, will, it'll look like they're a good person, and all of a sudden you'll find out something. And you'll say, wow, would have never, I, I can't believe that. I would have never known, I would have never guessed, would have never thought. And the reason is because there's something here that doesn't match what's outside. And God says to these people that have a good king, that are living in good times, that have a good prophet, God says to them, you're Sodom and Gomorrah, and you're Sodom and Gomorrah when you look as though you're bringing me sacrifices. When you look as though you're good Jews, and you're keeping the law. See, it's vain. It's empty. It's useless. It's worthless. It doesn't mean anything. And then he goes on to say, When ye appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? When you come into my house, who told you to come and do what you're doing? I don't mean to be unkind, friend, but most of what is done in the name of worship today, God says, who told you to do that? The God said, they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. You know what most of us do? We say, God, this is really good, and this is what we're going to do. That's what worship is. Uh, God, this is what I believe is right, and this is what I'm going to do. And God said, who told you to do that? You know what worship is? Worship is putting ourselves where we belong and putting him where he belongs. You know... Our understanding of worship is so skewed, so misconstrued, that I think we're so far away from it, we've only got a glimmer of what it actually means. And God said, I didn't tell you to do that. And so you wasted your time. You know, there are, there are people that sincerely believe in themselves to the extent that they spend their whole time, their whole life, doing something for God that God never told them to do. And it confuses us, doesn't it? I never question the sincerity of a person that tells me they're sincere. I've met individuals that are doing things that contradict the Scripture. And they say they're doing it for the Lord and they mean it. And if you get to know them, you realize, man, this person's as sincere as can be. And their problem is they're doing something God didn't require. There is something God does require, but that's not what they're doing. Instead, they're doing their own thing. And Christian, it may be that instead of obeying the Word of God and serving the Lord the way the Bible teaches, it may be you're doing your own thing. You got your own way. Well, I just don't believe that about God. I just don't believe that we have to do it that way. I don't think that God is so closed-minded that he doesn't understand the way I am. He made me. And so he's got to understand what I do. And God says it's vain. It's empty. It's useless. And he calls them Sodom and Gomorrah. If that's not a heavy indictment, I don't know what is. If that's not surprising, if that's not shocking, these are not people that I would call that. I'd say, look at their sacrifices. Look at their faithfulness to go and tread the courts of the house of God. And God said, I didn't ask them to do that. I didn't tell them to do that. You ever ask God what it is He wants instead of telling Him? I fear that so many Christians... Ask God what he, then instead of asking God what he wants, they tell him. I love the zeal of a new believer, don't you? Don't you love when somebody's newly saved and, you, and, the, and they really, I mean, they what we call really get it. I mean, some people, don't they get saved and, and they don't really get it? You say, Pastor, I don't, if they don't get it, I don't think they're saved. Come on, some of us are slow, <laughs> aren't we? Some of us just don't, don't quite get it for a while. Eh? There have been times when 
It, it <coughs> has nothing to do with whether or not I'm growing, but it has to do with the rate that I'm growing at. And the same is true for you. Some of us aren't starting as fast, and some people just don't get it as quick as others. But some people get saved, and they, what we call, really get it. And then many times, um, they begin to get excited about doing things. And they'll, I, one of the things, though, that I've noticed about people that are newly saved or just beginning to grow and they never have before is that they think they're the only one that's gotten it. You know what I mean? <laughs> In other words, it, it happened to you 20 years ago, but it's happening to them now, and now they think that, um, they think that they've invented the wheel. And they think that they're the first. And uh, many times they've got better ideas than God does. I all the time meet people that have got brilliant ideas. Matter of fact, almost every week I get phone calls of people trying to profit from ministry in brilliant ways. Uh, almost every week I have people that call me and want me to have some kind of seminar or some kind of thing where people can come to our church and they can make some money off you and I can get a cut of it. <laughs> you know, uh, or almost every week I have somebody call me and Try, they want to come to our church and, and get our people's money. They want to get us to give. The people in your church have got money, and we're going to get it from them and get it into the church, and we'll get some of it too. And they've got great ideas. And uh, usually they don't like me because I say, well, I just believe that people ought to just give. And we're not going to do that in our church because I don't think that's right. I, we're not going to show our people how they can get free groceries, and I can get 10% of whatever it is that their residual crooked scheme is. Um, I'm not going to get people to, um, we're not going to have a last will and testament where I can get you folks to make our church or myself uh, the person who is the executor or the beneficiary of your will. Um, and there's all these schemes to get money from people. And what I always say is, you know what, God's people ought to give. And they ought to give God's way, no strings attached. There you go, and that's the way we do it in our church. And it's interesting, um, <laughs> had a man call me, he's a very good man, he's really trying to help some churches, I think, I think he's very sincere. He says, you know what, churches are in a real mess in these times. And he said, man, I mean, he said, they're in debt, and they're, they're upside down and all these other things. And he says, you know, I know your church is the same, and you could use our help. And I told him, I said, you know, our church isn't in trouble at all. Matter of fact, our times are better than they've ever been. And things are better than they've ever been in the last five years. And, uh, <laughs> What's the reason for it? Well, we don't embrace those philosophies that, that we've got to have what we want now. And we, we've got to do things the world, but the whole world thinks that way. And so all the time people are coming and they've got better ideas than God does. You know, we just believe that we ought to do it God's way. And everything that we have ought to be God's way. And everything we do ought to be God's way. And that's what God receives you can't tell God how to grow a church. I'll tell you, the church today has seminar after seminar after seminar on how to be successful, and God says it's Sodom and Gomorrah. Pastor, that's not very nice. No, I'm serious. If it's not God's way, God doesn't care what you did. He doesn't care how big the crowd is if it's not his crowd. And what is success is not success if God is not pleased. That may not sound kind, that may not sound nice, but Christian, I don't want to be part of a crowd that says that success is anything other than God, that God says. How do you define success? Ask yourself that question. What would be successful? If next week you came and there were 300 people in this room, would you say we had a successful week? Hope so. How do we get them there? Is God pleased with what we did? Is he pleased with the result? Hey, listen, I'm for getting people in the church however you can get them there. I, I really am. I, I, think that it's, I think it's fine. I'm not against methods. I'm not against getting people to church. But I think we need to have God's power. And we can fill this room up, and I promise you, if we don't do it God's way, it doesn't matter if we filled it up. Man calls it success, and God says otherwise. And God knows the heart. Knows the heart of the thing is here we have a crowd in the temple and the altars are full of sacrifice. And God said, This much of it is acceptable to me. When I read a text like that, that makes me sit and pay attention. What about you? 
Because the truth of the matter is, is that I can identify with those people more than I can with people that do right. I can identify with having great ideas and great visions and how to grow a church more than Jesus Christ. If you look at what the Bible defines a church as, most churches don't meet the description. Look at what the Bible says a church is, you'll find out most churches aren't churches. God's way. They're a crowd. They got things going on. And they're putting up big edifices and big buildings. And, and uh, the world says they're successful because they're being evaluated by the world's terms. And God says it's not worship and I'm not pleased with it. And I'm telling you something. You can have the doctrine this church has. You can have the kind of preaching that goes from this pulpit. And you could be the very kind, same kind of thing. Because it is not the action that's different. God is not saying don't bring sacrifices into the temple. God is saying your sacrifices do not come from the heart and therefore they're the same as the sacrifices of Sodom and Gomorrah and he calls them that. What do we do about it? Verse 16 gives the answer. He says, Your new moons, your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They're trouble unto me. I'm weary to bear them. <laughs> he says, your, your worship just bothers me. And that, you imagine, here we are worshiping God, and God says, that, that just really troubles me. Wow. Whoa. Big deal. Big problem. God said, I'll hide my eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. God said, you come and you talk to me, and I don't hear a thing. I don't hear a word you say. Because your hands are full of blood. You're not innocent. There's no innocency. Christian, I want to tell you something. Personal holiness is far more important to God than what you bring to the altar. Personal holiness is far more important to God than how often you keep a required whatever. And God's answer to their problem is, your hands are covered with blood, wash you and make you clean. Now this is encouraging to me. This is a breath of fresh air. When I start reading Isaiah chapter 1, I'm like, whoa! <laughs> there's no soundness, there's nothing good from the head to the feet. It's all putrefying sore. To me, that says that's hopeless. And then right after we're indicted, we're given hope. And Christian, I want to tell you something. One of the best places you can be is right after guilt. So many times we resent God convicting us or hearing truth. We need to be the kind of Christians that invite rebuke. And I don't think we need to qualify that statement at all. We'd be the kind of Christian that says, tell me if I'm wrong, I want to know. And not, I dare you tell me if I'm wrong. Not the squinty-eyed, come talk to me about it. <laughs> no. Tell me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> Show me if I'm wrong. So that I can be cleansed. So that I can be clean. Do you want to know? You want to know the truth? You want to know? See, here's a whole nation that except for a remnant is just like Sodom and Gomorrah. And Isaiah says, here's some truth for you if you want to know. The truth is, is that there's nothing good in you. You're a putrefying sore. Wash you and make you clean. I remind you that that is not something that is simply for the nation of Israel. Their religion was fake. Their sacrifices weren't required. They weren't what God asked for. Worship is not what God, or it's not what we say it is, it's what God says it is. And these people, uh, they had all kind of problems as a result, but their call was a call to repentance. And that's the reason that God shows us our sin. <laughs> and that's the reason God exposes our state. I've said many times, and I believe it's absolutely true, that the, there are the two great liars in the world are Satan, who is the father of all lies, and ourselves, because 
we're good enough liars to tell a lie and believe it. And you know, I'll tell you something. You try to say, well, that person's the biggest liar in the world. He's not as big a liar as you are. It's just not. You're the biggest liar because you can lie well enough to believe it. I'm insulted many times when people lie to me and how dumb they think I am. Is it kind of, and sometimes when people lie to you, it's, it, it just it, it bothers you because of how dumb they think you are. I had a man lie to me uh, just a couple weeks ago, and he deliberately lied to me. And it wasn't, I mean, to me, it's just not very nice because what you're saying is I'm really dumb because a lie is so unbelievable. Um, we, we got a uh, monitor at CompUSA uh, for our nursery so that the nursery workers can see our monitor. And before we did it, I, I, I uh, just thought I shouldn't shop at CompUSA because I've never had a good experience there. They always rip you off with the rebates. And they, they have things that aren't even the small print. It's not even printed that are actually rules and qualifications. They always rip me off every time, and they rip me off this time as well. And uh, so I called them about it. I said, hey, this is the deal. And the guy said... That isn't us. That's not CompUSA. That's Vizio. And I'm thinking, no, it can't be Vizio. Vizio doesn't have your rebate policy. You have your rebate policy. So I talked to him about it, and he spent about 45 minutes explaining to me that it wasn't them. So I called Vizio, and Vizio did a conference call. <laughs> they called CompUSA and said, listen, pal, that ain't so. Well, then uh, I couldn't get a hold of the guy. So I went down to the man that lied to me. He spent a lot of time lying to me. And the fact is, when I found out what he was lying about, he was such a blatant lie, he knew he was lying to me. And so I just went down, I was, by the way, I didn't, I didn't yell at him, I didn't say anything. I just, I just said, you know, you knew that wasn't true when you told me that, didn't you? And he's like, oh, I didn't know that. I just, it was, he's the manager of CompUSA. He knew. I mean, he knew what their policy was. He knew it wasn't Vizio's policy. He knew it was his policy. But I confronted him with his lie. And he said, you know, um, this is why I'm bothered about shopping here and why I'll advertise for you. Because you deliberately tell lies. And he did. And, I, and honestly, folks, it is a CompUSA policy. <laughs> they, it, that's the way they do business. They're crooked. And uh, so there's your advertisement for them. If you'd like to do business with liars, <laughs> shop at CompUSA. It was an official endorsement. Um, they lied. It bothers me when people lie to me because what they say is, you're so dumb you'll believe this. And you're so dumb you tell a lie and believe it. And you're the one that told it, so you know it's a lie. And that's the way we are with motives in our hearts. I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm just, I'm just doing this because I want to serve God. And I know what these people think about what I'm doing, but this is the reason I'm doing it, liar. You're doing it because you're buttering up your flesh and you're trying to feel as though when you serve your flesh and when you do the wrong thing that you are justified. And how many of you go and take the Bible and use it like a legal book? and try to figure out a technicality that you can either escape by or that you can use against someone. And that's your motive. Your motive isn't truth. Your motive is, how can I get out of doing the right thing? Or how can I do the right thing and have it benefit me? How can I be technically right? How many of you are technically right Christians? Well, technically, Pastor, I don't have to. That's a technicality, Christian. And I want to tell you something. That's your attitude. Your heart's wrong. It's putrefying. It's Sodom and Gomorrah. Literally, these individuals are called Sodomites. There's, 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 you've gone into abominable, despicable, indescribable sin of all kinds. Today, Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodomites, you know, that, that's what they call uh, homosexuality. It included that in Sodom, but it included much more than that. It included every kind of sin, just wholly gone over to filthiness. And these are people bringing sacrifices into the temple and treading the courts of God, and God said, I didn't ask for that, and I don't want that attitude in here. And these are not the people that you and I would have indicted that way. And I'll say to you, neither of you, I wouldn't say that about you, but what's the Lord saying? What's the truth? Because that's when it's important. See, these people are told you're filthy and then they're given an opportunity to wash and be clean. And Christian, it may be that here this morning you're convicted. I'll tell you a good way to know you're convicted. You're bothered. And you may be bothered and you may be act re reacting properly. You may be reacting improperly. You know what an improper reaction is? You know, the preacher's always doing this. Why does he always have to mention? Why does he always have to go? I'll just tell you something. 
That's not a proper reaction to truth. It's not a proper reaction to the Word of God. A proper reaction is God showing me if I'm wrong. And if it hits me, then I know it. And I'm going to get right. And I'll respond in the correct way. And God says, wash you and make you clean. You know what 1 John 1, 9 says? You ought to have that verse memorized and you ought to use it every day. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to wash us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And here we are, filthy sodomites. And God washes us. And washes us how? We've got blood in our hands, but it's the blood of men. God takes the blood of Jesus Christ and makes us white as snow. Here's the, here's the invitation. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. What does it mean to seek judgment? You know what seek judgment means? God says, learn what's right. Learn to do well. You've got your truth. You've got your sacrifices. You've got your way of worship. And God says, learn the right way. My way. Educate yourself on what the Word of God says. Stop saying, I think, and say, the Lord says. You'd be amazed at how many times in a week I say, doesn't the Bible say? And people say, I'm telling you. And I'm telling you what I think. And you say, well, doesn't the Bible say? And they say, well, I just, you know, you've got to understand. You say, well, doesn't the Bible say? And it just blows right over the top of their head that it might be important what God thinks. It might matter what God's Word says. And it might trump your opinion and mine. Because we've all got opinions. We all think, and we don't need to, we need to obey. Pastor, you know, if, 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 if I were what you preach, I'd just be a robotic Christian. Just whatever the Bible says, I'd just do. God sure be pleased. He'd sure be clean. Learn to do well. The first command. Wash, be clean, learn to do well, seek judgment. Now, judgment is, is, is not the same as, as our being condemned or our receiving damnation. It's not the idea here. Judgment is right or wrong. You know, it's interesting. Children are pretty good at seeking judgment. And they're really pretty good with receiving it as well. I, we all have born in us a sense of justice and fairness. And uh, it's a source of bitterness when... Things aren't right in, in our lives and, and when we've been treated in a way that's unfair or unjust. A kid will come to his parents, though. Two kids will come. You ever had two kids come? No, you have to be parents, but they'll go to somebody seeking justice. Well, he wants all of it. And he says that it should be his because, and I say it should be because, and they're coming and they're bringing it because they want to judge. They both think they're right, but they really want to judge. You ever wonder about the two women going to King Solomon? Remember this? Uh, I love reading about it in, in Huckleberry Finn when, um, when Tom gives his, his view of the whole thing. But uh, here are two ladies come to King Solomon. One lady says, it's my baby. The other lady knows it's not. But she says that it's hers. One of them had a dead baby and one had a live baby. Both of them knew the truth. It's interesting. Both of them sought judgment. Isn't that interesting? Even that was one that was wrong went before the king to be judged. Isn't that interesting? You know, even people that are wrong many times need judgment, desire it, want it. But these individuals that are pretending to be right don't. You'll avoid judgment if you're avoiding being right with God. If your sacrifices and your service to the Lord are vain, they're empty, they're useless, they meet this description of being called Sodom and Gomorrah, you will avoid judgment. And you'll want, not want to go before. Uh, you'll, you'll deal with this person, but you won't deal with somebody that could hand down a judgment. And a person that wants to know the truth, first of all, seeks it. He tries to find out. The, he tries to learn to do well. He seeks judgment. And then the scripture says, relieve the oppressed. And it's interesting that these are people bringing sacrifices that are told that. See, so many times people look to their own works and their own goodness and they say, oh, I'm so good because look how merciful I am and look at how much good I do for the needy and how much I help them. And God says to these people that are bringing sacrifices, relieve the oppressed. 
In other words, even what you're doing in the name of charity is fake. Everything you've done is similar to what I require, but it's not the same because of the heart. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed. Judge, isn't this interesting? Judge the fatherless and plead for the widow. God said, be interested in truth and righteousness. So many Christians are so more merciful than God is. So many times you are so more merciful than God is. And by the way, let me just say something. That's what you think, not what the truth is. So many times we are so much better than God. You say, Pastor, I would never say that. No, but you do. You say it when you say, I know God's word says, but. What you mean by but is, I've got a better plan. In my situation, God doesn't know best. In my situation, the one who knows best is me. And what you're saying is you're wiser than God. I want to tell you something. God's the judge. And he'll be the one that judges that. How about just seeking judgment and saying, God, I want to know what you say. I want to know what's best and I'll do it. By the way, life that way is simpler. It's easier to be judged than to be judged, be the judge. You know, when you put yourself in the position of, of being the judge, you put yourself in a situation where you wear a great weight of responsibility. And either you are shirking that responsibility and you don't care, or you've taken on a burden that's greater than you can handle. You know, just a while back in the state of California, you remember what happened with they, they passed a they passed a proposition or a constitutional amendment, something like that, I don't know the equivalent of it in California, that said that they were going to ban marriage that is not marriage as defined by God. And the people in California voted that way. And one man, a judge who was living in a sinful relationship, made the decision to pass judgment and say that that was unconstitutional. You think he's concerned with upholding justice? With, with, is he concerned with being what a judge is? Being an impartial person who lays out what the truth is and what is right? He doesn't care at all about what's right. And I want to tell you something. You put yourself in the place of being a judge. You put yourself in the place that only belongs to God. And I promise you, your motive is every bit as good as his. As this man's. Because you see, your motive is self-serving. Your motive is it doesn't matter what's right, it matters what I want. And so I'll be the judge. God has a pretty strong indictment for that. See, we're not talking about those people. We're talking about these people. We're not talking about them, we're talking about us. We're not talking about you, we're talking about me. And you see, that's where we need to seek judgment. Oh, if, if, if only he got what he deserved, then I'd be okay. How about seeking what you deserve? That'll make you okay. You know, sometimes in this life, I want to tell you something. I mean, let me help you with something that's practical. Nobody ever gets away with anything. And there are individuals, there are individuals in this room, I'm sure, that have been wronged in a way that was extremely terrible. Beyond, I mean, today we would shudder if we knew the way you've been hurt and the things that have been done to you. I believe that there's probably people in this room that, that they would meet that description. And I just want to tell you something. Nobody's gotten away with anything. No person gets away with anything because every man stands before God. And either he stands in the righteousness of Jesus Christ or he does not. And God judges sin. And no sin, even for believers, goes unpunished. Because even a believer's sin is attributed to Jesus Christ, and Christ is punished for it. And God's a just God. And if your problem with God's way and God's plan for you is that it's just it's not fair and it's not right, you don't even have a comprehension of fair and right. God judged himself for the sins he forgave. When God forgives your sins, he does not wipe them out. He forgives them because they're paid for. God doesn't say, well, that doesn't have to be judged. Judged himself, judged his son. That's not fair, but it's just. It's a good enough payment for you to say, God, that's good enough for you and it's good enough for me. And you know something? If you'll seek justice for your sin and not seek justice for their sin, I'm not talking about 
taking upon yourself the right that doesn't belong to you. You know about something that's wrong, whether, regardless of what it is, and when the law condemns it, and it has to be judged legally speaking, you don't have the right to deal with it. You've got to take it where it belongs and let God's people that have been appointed to that task deal with it. You can't be a judge. You need to seek judgment, not seek to judge, you see. By the way, when we're told not to judge as Christians, that's really what the Scripture is talking about. It's not me passing judgment on you. It's you and I putting ourselves in the place of being judged. If we judge ourselves, we wouldn't be judged. Judgment's for us. Not for us to do, but for us to receive. And it's amazing that even children understand the, nest, the, the need of it. you ever seen a, a child? It happens probably to almost every child at some time if they have if they have good parents. They're in the situation of guilt and they want to be discovered. And sometimes they're so guilty they come and expose themselves. And they come and say, I did this. Mom and Dad, I've got something to tell you. I did this. Why do they do that? They're seeking judgment. Because they're not right until they get it. And it's just a relief. <laughs> you, ever, you ever been caught for something and you're relieved if it's finally over with? You don't have to hide it anymore. You don't have to cover it up anymore. It's just exposed. And now, you, now you can get right and be forgiven and confess it. and Now you're okay. It's amazing that after discipline, we're better off than we ever were before. We're cleansed and we're healed. And that's what we need to be clean. Sometimes we need to have the attitude that says, God, I'm wrong, and now I just need to have some, I need to have some judgment in it. Christian, you ever prayed for that in your life, or you just prayed, God, help me get away with it? <laughs> God, help me, God, help me not to be exposed. God, help me not to be found out. And God, deal with me. By the way, if you'll ask God to, be, to judge you, you won't have to be judged by men. If you let God judge you, you can deal with Him, and I'd rather have Him... Deal with me. You say, Pastor, I don't know if that's true or not. In our bulletin today, I put a text that had to do with the sacrifice that God received for sin. The sin was that David had numbered the people of the nation of Israel. And he had to be forgiven for it. You know what? Arana, who was another king, said, you know what? He said, David, he said, I'll give you this threshing floor and the oxen and the things to make a sacrifice with. He said, I'll give it to you. And he says, you know, if you're going to offer it to the Lord, I wouldn't charge you for it. And David said, no, I'm going to pay you for it. Because I'm not going to offer a sacrifice to God that doesn't cost me anything. But before he offered that sacrifice, do you remember that God gave him an option? He said, I can give you a plague. I can make a death angel, in essence, pass through and kill the people as judgment. Or I can allow you to be driven before your enemies. And David said, I would rather be judged by the hand of God. I'll take the plague rather than have the testimony of God be that he, I'm, we're being killed by those individuals that hate God. It's interesting, isn't it? We ought to seek judgment in that way. God, I'd rather be judged by you regardless. I'd rather have your consequences than to give the enemies of the Lord cause to blaspheme your name. You know, God doesn't despise a spirit like that. It's amazing. When you look at the sins that David committed, that he died in a right relationship with God, but he did. And you know, when we look at the sins that you've committed, I'm talking about you. I'm not talking about anybody else. I'm, no, we're, talking, we're addressing your sin now. The ones you know about and God knows about. You know, it's amazing. God forgives and restores, but that's what he wants if you'll seek judgment. Let's move on. We'll be finished. Come now and let us reason together. I'm in verse 18. Saith the Lord, Though your sins be as scarlet, as though they stand out and they're obvious and they're just bloody. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be as crimson, they shall be as wool. And here's a conditional clause. If ye be willing and obedient. Now, let me ask you a question. How many people here today have a choice about this? See, it's a hard thing, isn't it, when God judges you for something you have no choice about? You know, He never does that. And God says, if you'll have a right attitude, if you'll be willing and you'll be obedient, 
you shall eat of the good of the land. <laughs> this is absolutely astounding. The description of the land just a minute ago was that it is desolate. The description of the land is that the daughters of Zion is left as a cottage and a vineyard and as a lodge and a garden of cucumbers as a besieged city. In other words, there's nothing in the land to eat, but if you'll be willing and obedient, you'll eat good. Huh? God sustained the children of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. And they ate manna, which was good. And God says to you, if you'll just have the right attitude, things will be good in your life, and it does not matter what surrounds you. You know, I've talked to a lot of people that used to live in Fort Lauderdale, and here's what they tell me. I'm talking about Christian people that would go to our church if they lived here. And they said, you know, I used to live in Fort Lauderdale, but I moved away because that city's just wicked. <laughs> it's interesting that you can go anywhere in the country and you can find the same wickedness that's in Fort Lauderdale anywhere else. It's not, you know, the people here didn't invent it. But it's interesting to me that they don't understand this whole idea that you can be righteous anywhere. Well, if Fort Lauderdale is not a good place to raise children, why not? If Fort Lauderdale isn't a good place to raise children, it's because your home's not a good place to raise children. You can relocate that anywhere, and it'll be the same thing unless you change it. You can live anywhere, in any circumstance, and you can eat the good of the land. <laughs> isn't that nice? Isn't that amazing? Because, folks, we happen to live in our houses in the places that God's called us to be. And it can be good where you're at. You say, Pastor, not my place. If you'll be willing and obedient, yes, your place. Your home, your family, the people that are your neighbors, the circumstances that are unique to you, yes, you can eat the good of the land. And then, if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the word of the Lord has spoken it. So there's an ultimatum. If you do this, this will be the consequence. If you meet the condition of willing and obedient, go to the land. If you refuse and rebel, you're going to be destroyed. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. That's pretty much the way it is. Not then, but today. Not only for them, but for us. And if you'll do right, God will bless. And if you don't do right, then you'll have the consequences for it. And that's just about as simply laid out as anything in the world. The only thing that will keep you from being helped by it is if you won't face the truth, you won't seek judgment. But if this morning you'll make the decision, God, I just want to know the truth. God, I'm going to set aside my preconceived notions. God, I'm willing to set aside what I think. And instead of what I think, I will seek to learn the truth. And then, God, I'll seek judgment. I'll take the consequences for the things that need to be made right, because as soon as I do, I will be right. And that's a wonderful place to be, right with the Lord. And then you'll have God's blessing. Otherwise, you'll continue as what you are, Sodom and Gomorrah, and you'll go where they went. Heavenly Father, help us to receive your truth. Help us to seek judgment, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask that you stand to your feet this morning. We're going to have a hymn.